So, hi everyone. Thank you for being here. So, uh, thank you for coming to say. Uh, I've known you saying uh, for three, four years now. Yeah, so over that time, um, I fully got involved in the startup space and saw the state all the different events and really saw the space everywhere. And uh, over that time, uh, I found that um, Crusade is very humble um, and really it's a uh, I spouse is a startup value and something like sharing and, and really bringing myself out, out there for everybody. And so, um, I just had a question, maybe you can start like um, way back, you know, when you were a kid, when you came to Canada four years ago? Is it four years ago? Five years ago. Oh, five years ago. And so perhaps you can tell us a bit of, uh, you know, the upbringing. Were you maybe an entrepreneurial family growing up or? No, my parents actually were, uh, were employees, so uh, I grew up in Damascus, Syria. Um, so Damascus is the capital, which is a very different place than where it is right now. Um, uh, when I grew up, just there was nothing entrepreneurial around me. I mean, the Syrians are entrepreneurial by nature. We do a lot of trading, a lot of people open small shops, small businesses. Because you either work for the government or you are entrepreneurial. There are no companies there. Where most of the, it's a, it's a, I don't know what you call it, it's a social dictatorship kind of thing. Uh, if there is such a thing, I can't, I don't know what it is, I just live, it's kind of like a fish in the water. Uh, so uh, I grew up there and I was, uh, all of my life, all I knew is my parents. We actually lived a very good uh, childhood because my, my grandfather was super rich. Uh, he used to, we used to put money in bags, basically. Uh, uh, but he, he he didn't like money. Money is very uh, looked down upon where I come from. So basically, if somebody would have, when he was, when they were hiding up money in his bag. I used to hear the story all the time. And the bags for him, and somebody would point out and say, oh, wow, you have a lot of money. He would actually grab the bag of money and push it to the person and say, take it. So he, he didn't actually, he, like, he didn't care about that. I wish he gave something to me, but <laughs> that didn't happen. So uh, yeah, so I think um, the all I, I didn't know what entrepreneur is. We don't have that word in, in Arabic actually. Um, we don't have that mindset. So if you give you an idea, so uh, all of my life, all I knew was people around me were cool. Right. And were you always kind of like working in the things growing up and trying to? No, it was, it, you don't. When you grow up in in Syria, basically your life is. Very planned. You, you finish school, you go to university, and then from university you basically uh, get married. Um, try to uh, your biggest dream is a house, a car, and a nice wife. If you're a man, obviously. Um, so, uh, so that's 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 the the mindset. You don't even think about it because that's your that's the path. That's the path that everybody uh, around you have, have done. Um, until I, I, I found myself, I think the, the thing that got me to become an entrepreneur without knowing what an entrepreneur is, is uh, uh, Syria had, had a lot of troubles like, when it comes to money, especially uh, as sanctions came about, as uh, there was a need for, for more money, but the salaries remained stagnant. So just to give you an idea, my parents' salary, each one was $100 per month. So that's so we couldn't live on those salaries. So we had to. Uh, my uncle we used to send us money um, around a thousand dollars, kind of, to survive for several months. So what happened is that uh, my dad got bored with all of this and he wanted to uh, make more money, so he traveled to the Gulf. Unfortunately for him, he traveled at the time. The Gulf is in, in that part of the world is where you go and work. And there's a lot of money, you earn money, you send it back. So uh, he went there when the first Gulf War happened. So, so he couldn't he couldn't send us back money. He wasn't in the like the Gulf War happened, of course, in Iraq, in, in Iraq. So he was in Oman. So, but he couldn't send us money. So the first uh, the first year of university, I had money to commute to university, but no money to commute back. So university is free. Uh, so my first entrepreneurial idea, you know, my first idea to make money was to borrow money from my friends. Um, 
it wasn't successful because I had very few friends. <laughs> and my friends were smart because they figured out like, hey, this guy is borrowing money that has never returned it back. That's not good investment. So um, my second idea was to work. I used to draw, so I actually started looking for work, and I ended up working as a freelance designer way before Photoshop. I used to draw by hand, and uh, that started the whole thing. I was studying engineering at the time, construction engineering, and I ended up uh, working as a freelancer. At the time I graduated, I had my own uh, company that did uh, marketing services. I didn't know I was an entrepreneur. I just knew that that's the way I made money. Was it just like a just kind of like survival or just something that? Kind of I would no, actually, actually, I made very good money at the time. I I, I made uh, money, good money that sustained me, and I I made good money that I would please people to help my parents. As well. So I helped my parents and uh, and paid money to, like, for for the home and was was participating. And uh, by the time I graduated, I had a company and I did some successful stuff uh, in the sense that I did. Before largest competition across Syria compared to a small country like that. Um, uh, and, and I did, the first idea was kind of like a Craigslist, but on paper. Uh, it was like uh, 25 companies on the same paper, and I distribute that paper in different places, and they kind of co-advertise themselves. And with a competition at the bottom, with a slip, and people who write, pretty old-fashioned marketing right now, it sounds like ages ago. That was the 90s. So that's 1997. So when I graduated. So yeah, that's that was and it was successful. I, I got the top telecom company uh, in Syria to sponsor and uh, to give awards. And that telecom company, just to give you an idea how old I am, they 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 did not do mobile phones. They did the phones. That's <laughs> that's that's the first sponsor. So uh, and by 2001, I, uh, 2002, I built my first tech company. Was aqua hired in within three months. Mm -hmm. And I um, saw some videos on YouTube that you were also involved in, in the tech space on TV as well. Yeah, it's, uh, you have to bring that up. <laughs> so so uh, I got the opportunity to be on national television when I was in Dubai. Right. Um, so the company that was aqua hired in 2002, what we did is we did games online. So we did flash games. And our first accomplishment at the time is making a flash game full screen. That's how old it was. Because that's like, oh my god, we were able to do it. So uh, the company that we did, it was like the Disney of the, of the Arab world. It's called Space Tomb. So they actually acquired uh, a of the whole team, gave me a position to buy. I ended up uh, moving to Dubai. And then by 2009, um, I got an offer to show up on national TV. It's called NBC. It's kind of like Good Morning America here, uh, or North America. And so it's a, on, on that show, I show up and I talk about uh, technology. I used to wear a suit. Please don't watch those videos. <laughs> so not I don't look technical. I, I, I wear suits and I talk about technology. And uh, it was fun. I had, I, had, I had a blast. It was an Arabic, though. I thought you understand. Right. And, and what? And through that process, what, what were some of the challenges that you kind of came across in, in you know, being in that like, yeah. uh, Well, the, the one, the, the period that I kind of skimmed over, which was in 2005, I built the largest marketplace for Arabic art in the world. And um, it, was, it was a massive media success. It was featured in Forbes, featured in uh, some of the top magazines there. I was hailed as a person who's going to completely change the Arabic art scene uh, forever. Um, and it was a massive financial failure. I, I partnered. <laughs> yeah, I, I lost. I don't have to make it up. <laughs> I lost. A, I lost a lot of money. So uh, I mean, you saw probably tweets. I lost a million dollars in that. In that uh, and it's a million dollars that just to give you like a sense of it. It's a million dollars I didn't have. So it's not like I had a million dollars and came back to zero. I was minus a million dollars, almost. Give and take. So I, I lost an apartment that I that I actually worked for and that like was was uh, kind of paying the mortgage on. Uh, I lost uh, like I had a lot of loans for the banks and I had a lot of uh, obligations for people that there were no contracts for. Uh, but uh, so it was it was actually a very very devastating experience because um, 
um, the biggest thing that you come out of that um, part of the world where I come from, um, failure is not it's not like here. It's like yeah, you know, like I built a company, it didn't work out, so I built another company. No, there it's like, oh my god, like like my parents and uh, at the time my, my dad was deceased, but my my wife, uh, my mom was like, what did, what have you done? Like how could you do this? And you would hide in shame from everyone around you. Because you can't tell people, it's like, you know what, I lost money or something. You have to tell the appearance that you're successful. While the banks are calling you every day. Uh, like I get calls every day. And the banks there are not like here. Uh, they threaten you like to the maximum. In the sense that we were sending the police to your So we were sending the police to arrest you. We were, we're going to uh, raise a case. So every day basically for two years were some of the worst days that I've ever lived So it wasn't just the failure, it was what came with it. So, um, and that's an addition that I had a wife and a child, and I had to, to basically provide for them. So it's not like, well, you're an entrepreneur, you're on your own. Um, and I wasn't like, I can't, usually in Dubai, a lot of the kind of the, uh, the talks around Dubai is that people sometimes, especially on the, on the downturn happened, the uh, financial downturn, a lot of people pick up a leap. So I wasn't, I, I just chose not to do that. My partner was, well, didn't take an asshole basically. <laughs> uh, he, he basically said, listen, we, we don't have contract with those people, we don't have to pay them. Um, and, uh, and I said, no, like I, this, this will stay with me. I don't care what, what we have contracts or not. That's not who I am. So I actually had to work around three years to pay everyone back. Uh, I paid almost everyone back, except for the lawyers. <laughs> That's another story. That's another story I'll tell you about. Um, but uh, I paid. Like I, I got back to zero by 2009, and that's why like I felt like I'm free. I uh, it took me three years to do that, and um, I had. There were some awesome people who said, "Listen, you. Uh, I know you owe us money, and I know you, you did your best. We, we like there were like some people who actually uh, invested in us and kind of supported us, and then said, "Listen, we don't have to pay back." So they, it's not like a, it's not time, <laughs> and uh, you call on them and nobody answers. So like it was it was a very long period. It was, uh, I felt like I, I mean I was a, a lot of time on my own. And I have to give props for my wife because she was the, the person that kind of helped me uh, pull back from that. She's, she's amazing with money and managing things. I mean, she had to, she had me to be with it. <laughs> so uh, so we, we basically together came back to zero by 2009. And then I made the decision. I was like, okay, I'm leaving my job. And she's like, what? I said, yes, I can. Uh, and because uh, by then, in 2007, I started a, a small ad agency and grew it to seven people uh, to be able to pay everyone back. I had a partner, and uh, by the end of 2000, uh, 2009, or mid-2009, he was very invested in property, and he, he lost a lot of money. He said, listen, let's close our company, and uh, we start all over again. But you have to fire everyone. I said, hell no, don't fire anyone, anyone, anyone actually. And so I left. My wife like wanted well, to kill me. Uh, but within three, four months, I had one of, one of the biggest contracts I've ever had as a freelance writer. I kind of recognized at the time that uh, design and graphic was going to be commoditized. I saw like, prices for it going down, and I saw the content explosion. So I saw this content is the biggest thing, and I used to write, I took pride for granted, and then I moved fully writing, and I got some of the biggest contracts ever. And so, um, um, you mentioned your wife, like, saying, I have been very difficult time and yeah. encouraging and supporting you. Um, no, she was the hardest person <laughs> ever. And that's how she stood this to like, by beating the shit out of you. Um, I guess, like, aside from, like, you know, starting a company, you know, uh, finding, like, a whole family, very similar, because yeah. you spent a lot of time with that person. Um, and, yeah, um, what I heard is like, um, this is my own interpretation of that one, is that you have through that period of time where you could have just like walked away from that. But you, you kept that work through it. Um, very similar to, let's say, most startups that are like, challenges that you go through, um, finding women and whatnot. So, um, perhaps you talk about um, like finding a co founder, like you're, you're going to find another partner, um, 
what what uh, characteristics would you look for about you and whatnot? Well, number one, my wife is my co-founder in every single company since then. Not by choice. <laughs> She's like, okay, you're not doing any business without me supervising. No, I, I think the, the biggest thing is I have I have amazing co-founders, including my wife and, uh, and some other co-founders, one of them is here, Sean, is uh, the biggest thing is uh, I, people say don't work with friends, but I don't believe in that. I think if you can't like the person and you can't, uh, my first rule is I never work with people I don't like. Like, life is too short. If I'm stuck with, with that person in the elevator, I don't want to kill myself. You know, I want to be able to kind of survive being in an elevator stuck with them or stuck in, a, in an airport, uh, you know, uh, boarding area, whatever you call it, or having lunch with them. But I can't just have someone as a partner just because they're good at what they do. Um, I had, I tried that. One of the biggest challenges is in why that company failed is because I believe what my partner told me and I didn't believe their actions. Uh, so right now I actually try, so my, my model of working is I work with the person first and then I partner with them. So I invent any reason. It's kind of like I, I uh, related to playing uh, football with them. I mean, Sarah would play football with speed. Okay, that's that kind of football, soccer basically here. Yeah. So, uh, so you can't, you can't just say, okay, let's form a team and let's go play a championship. And you haven't shot some goals together. Like you have to play together, see what is their synergy. Do you actually like understand each other? Is their understanding beyond the, the conversation? And then you can, you can probably uh, engage in like, hey, let's, let's build a company together. Uh, so most of the co-founders that I, that I work with are people that I worked with before on several projects. I test them. I actually uh, want to see them in the toughest time before the, uh, like, usually I bet, let's work on a project. There's no money, no time, and uh, it's actually like a big thing, and we might not ever make money from it. And I see how they act. Um, and uh, I end up finding some of the best people. And what I do is, if there's a different, if there's a new project, I like to work with people that I worked with before. So I'm, I think it comes from uh, my likeness of people and likeness of building relationships. So I don't know that this works for everyone. Not, not everyone can work with their friends. Uh, so but that's how it works for me. Okay. Um, and uh, one question is, um, how did you move from like suit to teaching or like startup? Uh, uh, in, in Dubai, I tried to do that. It doesn't work, especially if you work with government. You have to show up all the suits. It's it's all about the pen there, and the watch, and the car you're driving. It's all about appearances. There. It's it's what they are. It's not that they are all about like. It's not that they are, for example, fifty people. They're they're amazing people that are there. But just the way that it is, it's a very appearance-oriented city. Uh, you have to look like you have millions of dollars, and, and people will not sit with you. Uh, not deal with you if they kind of perceive that you're lower uh, on, on the class in English. Um, so coming here to Vancouver, first of all, I have a ton of suits in my, my closet that I order over that I never use at all. So coming here, I walk around and like there's only one street where people like walk in suits, which is Broadway. But, but other than that, <laughs> other than that, like what? Like nobody, nobody goes to work here, and apparently people go to work in, in t-shirts. Like I remember the first company I worked with here, it's called Trinity Logic, great company, great people. Uh, we had a meeting with clients, and the clients were like the, I think, what was it, Disney or something. And I walked in and I'm wearing like a, like just a blazer on top of the t-shirt, and the CEO said, no, we're not doing that. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, no, we're a tech company, we don't wear that kind of thing. So, okay. Okay, so, uh, that was it. I never. I, I sometimes like dress up a little bit and wear a blazer, but but most of the time it's a t-shirt, so it's kind of freeing. And obviously, I worked at also at Launch Academy, so I had an endless supply of free t-shirts. So I had a free t shirts What's better than, than uh, a suit is a free t-shirt. And so um, I had a question, like just in terms of like uh, like the business culture. Yeah. Um, maybe the value system here. Value system design. Uh, you mentioned like. Um, I'm sure it's just like not out there. Um, and like you say t-shirt culture, whatever it's over there. Um, what are the differences that you see between the two and uh, what adjustments that you have to make to come over there? All right. Uh, 
right, so good question. Um, the biggest the biggest difference is, well, number one, we work 10 times harder there. <laughs> Not to take anything away from here, but to, there, um, I would I would sit with a client, they would explain, you know, we have, uh, they will talk about this, this massive project that they want to do. Uh, like, I remember even the, the company that I was acquired, uh, Space you know, the CEO would come to me, and this is a real thing. It's like, we're brainstorming this, and we're talking about an amusement park, designing an amusement park. Okay? I was like, great, and we exchanged some ideas. I said, yeah, I like your ideas. Uh, can you start working on this presentation? I said, okay, when is the delivery date? Three days. We're presenting to the Dubai government in three days. And guess who I'm competing against? I'm competing against a company that he invited that had six months to work on the project. I was like, okay, first of all, you never say no there. There's no like, I can't do it, I won't do it. It's like, because the door is right there. Because there's 10 other people waiting to do it. People are hungry. So it's like, okay, fine. Three days, we presented, we landed the thing. Nice. So, how I can sleep, right? Like, I, so the, basically, I mean, of course, that's the that's let's say one part. But the bad part is you don't have a life there. Because at ten thirty, the client will call you. It's like let's go out for coffee <laughs> and talk about and talk about work. That's what happens. Like literally, we, we go at ten thirty. I'm sitting with a client ten thirty p.m. and we're like actually having coffee and talking about the project. And tomorrow morning, there's a meeting. Or one of our clients who's working with the Ministry of Education. And the minister, the uh, minister's uh, consultant, media consultant, would call and say, "We were working on this project for a year and a half, like just to land this." And said, "Well, the minister has time right now. Can you come? Seven? What time? Eight? We have to go to a hotel to meet them. Seven? It's, it's seven. My wife is driving. I'm in the car doing the presentation on the way. We arrive at, at, at eight. I present. We land the contract. That's how things work here." I was like, no, I have to go ski on this day. I have my holidays. I'm traveling for a month. Like, how can you travel for a month away from work? I never get that. I, I can get that. I can get that if you're an employee to a certain extent. But how can you do that if you're an entrepreneur? So I, I got it. I got an appreciation for how people like people love life here. I didn't have a life there. Not that I do have life here. But uh, but people have 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 like. I got to learn that people have a life here. That people have um, have a different way of approaching things. Now, the other thing that they do great there is that they know how to market. One of the things that here now, now I'm not saying people work very hard there. People are super smart, but people in Canada suck at marketing. Honestly, like I didn't know that Hootsuite is a Canadian company, and I used to work in social media. I had an agency in social media. I used to be, I used to like a lot of trying homes. And I came here, and like six months after I'm here, I'm like, Hootsuite is hiring. Hootsuite is hiring Vancouver. Fuck, they have their offices in the, like their you know, headquarters in Vancouver. How did I not know it's a Vancouver-based company? And every day I stumble on a company that is based out of Canada, that is amazing. But around the world, they think these are North American companies. We never tell the story of Canada. Why? I think we have the, I, like, I call the holy trinity of marketing that, which is uh, here, uh, founders are always heads down doing the work. They, they love doing the work. Second, they're humble. And third, they suck at marketing. So, so these three actually come against us uh, marketing very well. In Dubai, they have an idea or an inkling of an idea. They take a, po a billboard, like, Six million dollar billboard. The company literally would be the, the name on the billboard and nothing else. And and they announce to the world what they're going to do, and they're probably going to do it in three years. So I'm not saying one is better than the other, but like you can find a happy medium. Uh, questions as you go. Uh, yeah, we we'll have a we we'll have, we'll have a Q&A at the end. Okay. And so just hold the question to the end. Um, just a question question for me. Just in terms of um, you, you mentioned branding, right? Like, um, in, in Canada, in Dubai. Um, do you think it's because of uh, the vision here? People you know, you mentioned humble. Are they not thinking we big enough? Are they you, like you mentioned that they're able and they're hardworking, they're all right? Um, but in terms of uh, 
maybe across our productivity or even like global presence or the people of interest on? I can I mean it's it's hard to generalize, but I think the general rule is that we don't do marketing. Like we um, I haven't met I mean I'm not talking about they do marketing on a, on a scale of a company, for example, but they don't they don't self brand. Like you don't see and it's there's a good essence like you meet you meet someone here and they would be an entrepreneur that just I don't know sold the company for a hundred million dollars. And they would, they would not, for example, brag about it, they would not tell the world about it. And there's, of course, a good side of it where you actually, they're humble, you can deal with them, they're down to earth. But I think when I'm talking about marketing, I'm talking marketing Canada, marketing Canadian brand of entrepreneurship. Uh, the, the, the companies themselves, there's another reason why, because most companies actually market to the US and they like it somehow, that they don't appear as a Canadian company. They want to not be seen as a Canadian company, maybe they want to be seen as a North American company in the world. Um, so there is, a, it's a combination of things coming together, but also as a, as for example, as a, I would say as, as government, uh, we, we don't, like we tell the story of how beautiful Vancouver is, but how many of us like talking about tech in, in Canada? Are we telling that story? Are we telling that story big enough? Um, and, uh, and I think it's it's important to tell that story, and I don't and I'm not the, the gateway for saying like we're not maybe they're telling it in a different way. But for me to be fascinated with tech and knowing, thinking that all the tech companies in or tech companies that we have that are based in Silicon Valley or based in North America, uh, coming from Dubai, have tell told me something. It's not like I, I can't search or find, but for example, that's the perception. So I'm wondering if that was my perception. What's, what would be the perception of others? So I think, um, yeah, it's a combination of people being humble, like the Canadian humble, uh, I think humble spirit, uh, focus on the work. Uh, because here you're seeing, if you, if you brag about some things, people see you like, uh, they, they see it as a negative. Uh, so I think we need to kind of get a little bit of American arrogance, a little bit, <laughs> It doesn't hurt, and uh, is that arrogance for a bit? Like all confidence. Well, I mean, I mean, arrogance in a good way. Like, I mean, you, if you've done something good, tell the world about it. You don't have to beat them on the head with it, but you can tell the world, "Hey, listen, I'm, I'm proud of it." Um, and uh, we don't, you, we don't use the tools. Like, you go to LinkedIn and you would see some of the best entrepreneurs here. You would think from their LinkedIn, that, like, uh, page that they are, they're just another dude. Yeah, for example, that they are that they are just another person uh, in the tech community, but um, uh, they've done some great things. I mean, uh, yeah, look at look at their LinkedIn page. You would, unless they are Ryan Holmes, but Ryan Holmes and then like everybody else here. So when there's no, they've done some amazing things, but they don't announce them. They don't they don't tell the world. And I think we have an obligation of telling the world about that, not just for our company, but for the other founders that are here. Right. I was just down in um, Silicon Valley um, in October, every year, of course, and just talking to um, C100 and the groups down there, the Canadian groups down there, and then also the American groups. And what I found is that um, they think very good in terms of like global, and also in terms of like Canadian companies, they're like, we have good stuff there. And really, a lot of the um, came to the surface is because of the uh, HP1B, uh, Trump and everything that's happening down there, and groups opening uh, companies here. Now, you were, you were at uh, launching companies for like, some time, uh, mentoring um, local companies here. Um, what do you see were some of the challenges there, maybe perhaps in changing the mindset of some of the entrepreneurs um, and really encouraging them Entrepreneurs, by definition, they think bigger. I think the biggest challenge is entrepreneurs in Canada are exhausted. Uh, entrepreneurs are in Canada are exhausted because there is zero support on the level of the game. Uh, government is, and all the all the entities of government are obsessed with, with getting anchor companies and supporting companies that are um, that are big. There is zero support for uh, early entrepreneurs. And where do uh, big companies come in? From 
young entrepreneurs, from early starting entrepreneurs. There are initiatives, but they're not enough. There's a ton of entrepreneurs here, but by the time they get to build a company, they're exhausted. It takes them seven years to build something that you build in the valley in three years or two years. More capital, more support. Of course, the ecosystem there is more built up, but in, for us to actually make up for it, we have to do what Israel does. If you look at Israel, what Israel does, they support young, young companies. They don't care about the companies because they know from the companies come big companies. That's how it happens. Big companies don't need our support. Hootsuite doesn't need our support. Uh, they're good on their own. They, they get to a point where they're growth and they have the funding and, and they attract the certain capital. But the other companies, they don't have anybody uh, reaching out to them. They struggle. So I think that's the biggest thing. It's not that the entrepreneur don't think that way. Entrepreneurs, by definition, they want to, if you ask any entrepreneur, they want to sell for everyone. They want everyone to use their apps. They want the growth to use their app. But meet them after three years of being in the bank or ecosystem. Like, I just want to like make some money, man. And, like, you know, survive, maybe get like a small round, and those, you know, uh, old style investors have, have like killed me with their due diligence that takes forever. You know, it's it's just it's just demoralizing to to, to see how talented they are and how hard they want to they have to work and how long they have to wait. Uh, because why? Because everybody is like focused on you know what. Can Microsoft open another office here? And yes, that's important. But by the time you support Microsoft to open another office, which they're welcome, but please stay. But by the time you do that, you could have actually helped a thousand entrepreneurs. Okay, if each one of them hires one or two people, or you get bigger than the next office of Microsoft. But that obsession with what sounds like, hey, we're, we're, we're actually getting more jobs. Because it sounds completely, Correct. Uh, so there's no no other. If you're looking for evidence for political correct political correctness here, BC Tech Summit. Why is it named BC Tech Summit? It should be named Vancouver Tech Summit, not BC Tech Summit. Nobody in the world knows what BC is. It's kind of like going to Toronto and say instead of Toronto Tech Summit, we're going to call it Ontario Tech Summit. Nobody knows Ontario in the world, but everybody knows Toronto. It would be ridiculous to call it anything other than wrong. So we have a brand that is worth $70 billion. And what do we do with it? Oh, we don't want to actually get the people in the Okanagan to be upset or uh, Kelowna. And that, they're not going to be upset if you get them all the investors in the world because everybody knows Vancouver. It's like, oh, this happening in Vancouver? I'll go, I'll ski a little bit, I'll meet some people. And then, you know, that's, that's how it happens. BC, where's BC Tech Summit? What is that? Nobody knows. You see this pixel where it's just because of the company. Uh, why people like why why they're doing it or why people don't come in? Uh, you can't it's, it's very hard to build BC into a brand. Vancouver's already a brand. So it's like in, imagine you're an entrepreneur and you have something that's already a brand and something that's not a brand. Where would you spend your money? You you bet on There's, see, the thing is, entrepreneurs will always fail, and we always have entrepreneurs that fail, we have, always have entrepreneurs that succeed. Access to capital will speed up that process. We'll speed up the failure, and we'll speed up the success. So we'll get more entrepreneurs uh, not stuck in that period where, are, am I a failure or a success? Am I a failure or a success? They get st stuck there for long, and they end up either getting like, you know, let's, let me find a job because I need to survive. Okay? Or, you know, like, okay, I'll, I'll continue doing this because I believe in it while, let's say, doing something else or uh, trying to get capital from somewhere else or short, making your dream smaller. You know, I'll settle for some jobs here or doing some work. You know, that's, that's the biggest challenge. When you, when you have insurmountable challenges or uh, uh, facing you, it's very hard to get that capital. And I'm not talking about giving money away to people. But I'm just saying that if if you have, we don't have even, people find it hard even to get meetings with investors. I even heard that some investors, like if you meet them the first time, 
if you ask them for a meeting, the next time some investors are asking you for a fee for like sitting there. Like, yeah, some, it's, it's crazy. I mean, Jason Calacanis was one of the top investors in the world. In his book, Angel, he said, when when I make time to meet entrepreneurs all the time. And there are, don't get me wrong, there are amazing investors here, but there are very few that make time to meet entrepreneurs. The first thing I tell you, you're not in our category. We're, we're supporting companies from this side to this side, so you're not, you're smaller, we're not going to meet you. So that person is left on their own devices. There's no one to tell them their idea sucks, or they need to leave it, or there's no capital for them, or they, if they change a few things, we'll fund them. There's nobody to do that. So they go around and find them. Is that the role that you're playing at Launch Academy? I used to play that. Launch Academy is one of the best places. I'm not because I joined it as a member. So just to, you know, I did start it, Ray started it with, along with Alex and Roger. Uh, I mean, uh, these, these are the guys that took it upon themselves to, they face the challenges as entrepreneurs, and they open a place where entrepreneurs can find that support, can find that help. I joined it as an entrepreneur, was super impressed with people that are willing to give up their time, entrepreneurs highly successful, to give up their time or to sit down with me and mentor me. And I gave back and then uh, I, I loved the process. So I, I stayed in as a general manager of the asset. I couldn't believe that they were offering me a job, honestly. Because it was like, I'll do it for free. Um, and just a total side note, I forgot to mention that uh, uh, actually, because uh, Google is the sponsor of Startup Grind. So, like anyone in this room, if you're starting a big company, you can get access to a in credits. So, like cloud credits. That's so, like G Suite, full G Suite for uh, 10 members um, for a full year. And you can also apply to the board as well. So, um, that's one of the perks of uh, like being part of uh, Startup Grind. Um, of course, it's open to everybody, not just Startup Grind, um, but to be in Startup Community in general. Um, also, uh, workspaces, uh, Google workspaces around the world as well. And um, C100, they have everything down in the valley as well. They'll connect you um, to the local people there as well. So, there are a lot of resources out there. Um, so, um, do think global um, in terms of uh, structure and then can, um, just an example, the, the Indian director came through, um, sat down, uh, explained the micro ecosystem. Um, the guy from Houston came through, talking about Austin, the, the startup ecosystem there. And so, if, do free, feel free to reach out um, if you're looking at those markets because those directors will come out and help. And so, um, they do live by really, really live by those values. Some people think they're crazy, um, but again, they're all free of their time to kind of build the ecosystem on a global not just in their own uh, arena. So. Some of those questions were you know, like capital and whatnot. Now, um, even down in the, in the valley, uh, what you find is the people when they uh, make introductions, they're like, what do you work on? How can I help? Help this person, help that person, help this person. And over time, you build a relationship. And uh, the valley, of course, the lot are really looking at Vancouver right now. So um, capital might, might be one of the things that they can help with. But uh, again, because they should be one visas and whatnot, Challenges over there. Um, a lot of companies are coming to Vancouver, so some challenges come in, not just like Amazon and Microsoft. Um, and uh, I think the last question that I would have is um, so, like, your current company as in education, mm -hmm. um, what's your vision for that, and what are you doing to do uh, with that? Well, I tell people that we live very privileged here in Vancouver. When I, used, when I first started my uh, freelance job and I wanted to learn, I used to earn, I used to earn around $100 myself or $200 at the time. From there I grew. Uh, but $20 for the price of a book, if I found Kriji Syria, $30. That was, that was like a third of my salary. So imagine to buy one book is a third of your salary. So I valued education really, really highly. And um, I wanted, to, I, at the time, I, I grew up obviously before the internet, but that was before the internet. And um, right now, there are billions of people around the world who don't have access to the same education. 
that we have. It says that ten dollars or twenty dollars will be used, of course, for a lot of money in different parts of the world. Um, not only that, eighty to ninety percent of people who, who buy online courses never complete them. So, uh, and the new technologies, emerging technologies, are uh, are being built, uh, and the experts are building them do not have the time to educate others. So we're trying to create, uh, we're working on building a, a platform and a tech product that helps people learn faster and, um, and teach faster. So uh, that is, my vision is to a world where people uh, have access to some of the top members in the world to kind of experience, because let me tell you, before landing in Vancouver, I never knew what a mentor is. I, I knew what a coach, I know what a mentor is. But, but somebody to, like a highly successful entrepreneur, like for example, Ryan Holmes, to sit with someone and give up their time to kind of mentor them, I've never experienced that. So it was, it was actually a very big shock. I mean, and people here, I go sometimes speak in front of students and I tell them, you're very lucky. As a student, you can reach out to any single entrepreneur and sit with them for a coffee. And they would sit with you. I sat down with venture capitalists here who sold companies for hundreds of millions of dollars. And they were like right across the table from me. I couldn't believe it because these people you will not see where I come from. If you made a million dollars, they were like, you, that's it. No, you're not talking to anybody. Okay? You're in your own world. So here you have people who are worth hundreds of millions of dollars who they take it upon themselves to help you succeed. So we're very lucky. I want those people to have access uh, of people who want to contribute to be able to help other people. Uh, and that's the vision of our company. We want to make education, um, helping people to learn fast. In emerging tech, you would go, I'm, I'm fascinated with blockchain. Um, if you want to learn about blockchain, it took me three months to learn how a Bitcoin transaction works. And not because I'm an idiot, or maybe a little bit, but uh, I, I'm an engineer, so I, could, I should understand this, but it took me a lot to find those articles that I need to read from the fluff. So even though I read 100 articles, I should have read two or three that could have given me the best picture. Now, now that I've been through that, I can tell the person that comes after me, hey, read those three, and that's it. So what if you could do that? What if with all the content explosion that you have in the world, you could actually curate that content into a course, an online course or an email course that you can share with people? That's the tool we're building where it makes it easy for someone who's an expert who doesn't have the time to curate the content and then make it available for others so that they can walk in their path. So that kind of mentorship, that doesn't require somebody to sit with you. I want to make, I want you to, wherever you are in the world, to have access to the people who want to contribute value, wherever they are in the world. So that's basically what we're doing. And uh, I think uh, the culture of Vancouver and the, the people who want to contribute here, this city is, in, that's why I'm, I'm very, sometimes I speak and people say, it's, it's, they, hear me, they hear frustration in my voice about what is possible and how much that is not seen in the world. We have marketed as a touristic city, and sometimes people, people surprise me and say, well, I think Vancouver people are cool to get people networks. I said, no, I haven't met people. You actually, in fact, if you network, I've met, I've had hundreds of colleagues, thousands actually. I've met thousands of people here. I have like 19,000 people in my network. I landed here, I had 2,000 of them, and now I have 19,000. So obviously, there are a lot of people who are willing to make uh, but we don't, uh, the people in the world doesn't have access to that. So I have a very, my mission is to, to help my community see in the world and help that kind of culture of giving and contributing to perpetuate. Because if everybody acts like the people who are successful act here, we would, the world would be very different. So, that is, that is the vision, that is what I'm super excited about, that's what uh, the uh, co-founders I'm working with that are, uh, uh, I'm, I'm super excited to be working with them. And you'll see some very exciting news coming in, so starting with our community called Vancouver Founders uh, that we're building, and uh, the new tool that we're bringing from Next Centrum. Uh, so yeah, so there's a lot uh, happening. Awesome. That's, that's the end of the commercial. <laughs> <laughs> hey, awesome. Um, I can use our talk, I guess, um, and this, uh, and we'll open the floor for questions. Sure, make it easy. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you kind of alluded to this when you started talking about 
Hootsuite, not marketing stuff, we didn't know it was in Vancouver. I grew up here, one of the things I sense around the city is that we have an inferiority complex and we don't, we, we like the idea of being from North America, which you alluded to, rather than being a Vancouver company, because gosh, people see us as Canadian. Well, we're not, we're kind of like the American little brother. Do you, do you see that out there from folks in Vancouver? Maybe that's one of the things holding us back, because we don't have the confidence. Um, I don't know. I can't. I can't talk, speak to that. I would say uh, most of the entrepreneurs that I meet here are super confident, like very. But I mean, I mean, sort of a, like, like not individually, individually. Yeah. Confident, but I don't just, think they think about it. Like I think it's a, it's a combination of things. Maybe you're you're more, you're more aware of it because I don't I don't necessarily compare them to the U.S. because I haven't dealt like I, I lived in the U.S. or or been around a lot in the U.S. I compare to. How people in the world interact. Like for example, everybody in the world knows the bot, right? And knows about the buy that has the biggest, whatever. So they're excellent in marketing. They take one before even building something, and they have the drawing of something, even if it's never built later, they would tell the world about it. We would have something that is genuine, built, you know, and, and great and delivering value, and we won't tell the world. This is not. This is, this does. It's not on the on the entrepreneur. Like the entrepreneur, you can't expect Ryan Holmes to go on to you. He's like I built the greatest company in the world. Obviously, you're gonna look like an idiot doing that. He does, he's not gonna do that, and he, he's not that kind of person. But you want a concerted effort from the the provincial government. The like, these are that's what who works there in Dubai. It's the government that goes out and find these things, and they partner with those projects and they tell the world about it. And what that ends up, it ends up with real money because that means that 15 million uh, tourists pass through Dubai every year. That's an insane number of people that spend a lot of money in the city. Uh, one thing, uh, like one thing, I came to know, which is crazy. I didn't know that the airports here are actually owned by private people, like it's not owned by the government. Which actually, that's like this is something I came to know. Which means that the planes. You, you have, that's why we spend a lot of we spend a lot of money moving from one airport to the other. That's why flights are so expensive. So if flights are so expensive in Dubai. What they did is they made Air, uh, Emirates Airlines. It's very cheap to fly anywhere, and that's essential if you want people to come. Like, these are things that that is it's not one thing. I can't say the point. Well, it's not the, it's all these combination of things. We don't have freaking Uber. <laughs> like, I mean, like, I mean, for fuck's sake! Like, what, what, what do you, what do you need? That somebody's like, oh, sorry, we don't have Uber. We're the tech city yeah. of of BC, and we don't have Uber. Like, that's insane. And you know what? Yeah, I get it that you people invested in the taxis, and I respect that. Well, tell Uber come pay the taxis back their money or their investment, and take over the city. So, because we want to get to a place without having to struggle through. through, through. It's all these small little things coming together. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we don't have well-meaning, great people working really hard. But sometimes we need somebody to step out and say, is this working with this? And is that working? And if, what if we actually look at it a different way and work together on it? And what if we change our thinking a little bit? So does that mean that people are not spending? No, but there is a lot of programs, spending a lot of money. But what if that money would combine together in a certain way? What if there's a, a, a certain amount of the, that funding dedicated to establishing the image of Canada as a tech hub in the world, establishing the image of Vancouver? Yes, I know we need to invest in companies, but, but that means foreign investment will come in. The last thing I want to say, I sat down on the, an initiative called the Metro Vancouver Prosperity um, Initiative, I think. I can't remember. The, it was a very long name. So I sat on it. There's a lot of there's a lot of mayors, a lot of the uh, heads of the universities on it, and I was privileged to sit representing the tech tech scene. And one of these biggest thing that came out of that study, um, they they had uh, what, I think one of the big boards, maybe McKenzie, studying and analyzing why is it Vancouver not getting the same attention that's happening around other similar cities in the world. And when they analyzed it, they found that nothing, literally nothing is missing in Vancouver. It's actually on par with all of these cities. The one thing that is not that is not happening is foreign investment coming here. Everything else we have, we have the transport system, all, all of these things, the infrastructure, all of that, 
but foreign investment is not coming. It's a problem of market. That's the core element. And this is not me saying that this, this is like a study by, uh, by a company that like, analyzes other industries. So we have a big problem with the marketing. If you don't have marketing, people don't know about it. It's like the basic thing in any business. Business is marketing because marketing brings a customer. Business without a customer is not a business. Other questions? Yeah, so you're explaining how you've got a lot of experience you know, with marketing and you're seeing you other background in writing as well. Yeah. So I'm wondering, um, like, from a you know, pretty early stage startup perspective myself, we're still trying to sort of find our voice and like find a way to market ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, the best for our customers. And then you were mentioning how you know people are pretty humble here, and, and like I've, I've sensed that myself, and I've sensed that in you know, other other startups that I see around here. So I was wondering, do you have any sort of learning lessons from, from your experience from creating like a brand or a voice and making it, you know, seem confident and, and, and you know, really selling it, but not coming across as, you know, overconfident or over the promise of something in your marketing that someone could sort of call you out on. Yeah, become a platform to raise others. So I had to adapt here. In Dubai, I, I used to market in a very different way, obviously. Uh, but. Uh, what I did here is how I actually grew as a personal brand here is by raising others around me. So I would find the best ways to help others around me all the time. I always take, uh, so in the I'll, I'll, I'll explain the big context and go to your startup how you do that. So as a, as a, as a startup, you are the brand for now. Like you can, people attach to a person more, more so than a brand. Uh, so let's say, so people are saying, well, Nexi Centrum is here to help you. People like, Nexi Centrum is an entity, I don't care. But if you're saying that's a person, I can speak to them, say I can know him, I can sit and have coffee. So it's always the person. So, and how do you grow your personal brand? You actually help people, because people will remember people who help them. It's called the social capital. It's kind of like, it's like, a, like a, a bank. You can't withdraw money from the bank unless you deposit money. You can't withdraw goodwill from people that you deposit with them. And a lot of that would go to waste because a lot of people you will never see again, they cannot help you back. But what ends up happening is by helping a lot of people, you build a very powerful personal brand. And uh, it actually feels fucking awesome because when when you are around, the people actually are very happy to see you, are very, uh, very excited about, you know, uh, helping you, like they look for the opportunity to help you. It's very, it's very cool. So you do that, now how do you do it in regards to your, to your company? You focus in an area where your company adds the most value. So for example, for us, I like to help people through education. So I offer mentorship, I, I build uh, online courses, I make them available, I show up and speak and, and do presentations around the topics that I want to teach on. So because you don't want to just help people, like when you say help people, you can help people in, you know, in a gazillion ways. So you want to help people in the best way that you do in your startup. So if you don't mind me asking, what do what you start with? So uh, we're making hiring and construction uh, easier and faster. Okay, very good. So one of, one of the things you can do is you can actually help, for example, offer uh, construction workers, for example, um, either uh, write articles or do, for example, uh, presentations in community centers to help construction workers find work. Something like that. That's, that's interesting because we've actually thought about things. Yeah, so something like that. See, how can I help so that it triples, like people start talking about me and start building that, that uh, word of mouth. Because when people start talking good about you, um, and especially your customers, like maybe your customers will not read an article on LinkedIn. You know? However, you need to do that because you need investment as well. So investors need to see. So remember, your customers are not just that. Investors are your customers. So yeah, look at them and find out what they need and where the challenges are. And I would, I would refer, the last thing I would say is uh, follow the principle of uh, hanging curtain. What does that mean? Uh, most people who sell drills, they say, oh, our drill is better, it digs better holes, you know, doesn't, doesn't create a mess, whatever. But people are not looking to drill holes. People want to hang a curtain, okay? So talk to people about hanging curtains solve the, the initial problem that led for them to need your product. Okay, so in your case, maybe it's not only just finding a job, but maybe keeping it. Yes? 
so <clears throat> you talk about how you lost a lot of money on one of your uh, companies. Yes, uh, unfortunately. So right now, <laughs> <laughs> right Sorry. now, when do you choose uh, if your idea is at a point where you can start to take responsibilities of higher people and things like that, like investing in in, yeah. in, in your team? Yeah, so, so our company actually did raise capital. Um, there are some things that you control, some things you don't. You don't control the market need, you don't control the market moves. But what you do control is how fast you respond to them and how much you're aware of them. So obviously, as an entrepreneur, you, the difference between an entrepreneur and an employee is the entrepreneur takes the responsibility the employee doesn't. I'm not talking about employee mentality, I'm not talking about the employee being hired. An employee can be an employee with an entrepreneurship. So an entrepreneur says, I'm responsible, I'll fix it. And Joe jumps to action along with the team and they can actually fix whatever they need to fix or build it or move things forward. An employee says, this is not my job, I did my job. That's their job, his job, their job, their job. That's an employee mentality. I did my, my thing, yeah, but the ship is sinking, yeah, but I did my thing. That's, that's the problem. Oh, but the company is losing money. Yeah, but I did my job. That's an employee mentality. So an entrepreneur takes responsibility. So it's a very hard thing to do. It's not easy to take responsibility. So yes, there is a responsibility of uh, my family. I have to provide for them. Responsibility of myself, my team. I have to be able to support my team and make sure that they actually, I deliver on the promises. And sometimes I can. So if when I can, I'm transparent. So one of the biggest learn, learnings that I got from that, from that uh, venture, one of the reasons that why it failed is because I hid a lot of things, because I was afraid of sharing uh, that I'm losing money, that things are crumbling on the inside. No, on the, on the outside, like, oh, everything's okay, we're awesome. So now it's like, no, <laughs> things are going to shit. You know, if something's not working, I'll jump in and say, hey, this is what's not working. Here's the problem that we're facing. And then you know what happens? People can share opinions. People share ideas. Before, I had the thing that I need to make things work. That's not responsibility, that error. That's true arrogance. When I don't believe enough in my team to ask for their help. When I'm not leader enough to be vulnerable and say, hey, I fucked up. Sometimes you have to say that. Listen, guys, I fucked up. I don't know what to do here. What do you think? And that's true leadership, when you actually acknowledge that you're human. You sometimes you get it right, and sometimes you fuck up. And that's the whole point of having a team. If you could do everything yourself, you wouldn't need a team. So that's basically the learning, and that's what I'm doing right now. Hopefully it's success. I mean, we're doing our best to be successful. That's what you can do. You can do, do your best. Um, luck plays a role, who knows? As long as I, I, I look back and I, I know that I didn't hold back at all, that's when I sleep uh, very comfortably. I do every night, every night. Because I never hold back. Yes? I, I remember before uh, I moved here, and it was like people spoke about BC. And BC for me was something totally different before Christ. That's way out, you know, AD, AD BC. So it arrived here and every BC, BC. I found it very odd. The same that you probably did, that people talk about BC. So when we're going, talking about branding and marketing, Vancouver is by far, for me, a much stronger word and something that we could be flying the flag with. And it's something that you mentioned. So is it just you or is there a cohort of people like you that is talking about it should be the Vancouver tech summit, it should be Vancouver this, that and the other? Are you a lone voice? Uh, no, there's a lot of people who said that, but they don't say it out loud. <laughs> and I can understand why. This is a Canadian thing. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Oh, hurt their feelings. Yeah, we don't want to hurt their feelings. We don't want to make them like, yeah, they're working hard. And they are. Like the, the guys that are, again, it's not about, this is the, what is it? There's two things. The road to, to health is paved with good intentions. That one would work. But the other thing is that it's not about, well, it's something sinister or people like conspiring to do something wrong. People are working very hard and they're doing their best. But I think that's where true arrogance is when you don't listen to the market, what the market's telling you, and you don't listen to people around you, and you don't open a forum for listening here. Every time there's a forum that I'm invited, I'm invited first, but never again. Just 
So I'm invited to say, okay, you know what, we have a problem. Like one time we were invited because the problem is uh, Canada, what is it? No, it wasn't housing, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, well, it's, it was a big problem. But it was uh, that Canada's investment in innovation has dropped for, by 30%. So we are, imagine we're, we're like a round, like we're, we're a square, everybody's sitting, government, universities, and, and we're talking about, hey, there's a problem, and our investment in innovation is now 30%. And they go around and say, what are, you, what are your opinions? Two people had, opinions about, well, we need to do something. The others were saying, but we have this thing working, but this thing's working. It was like, suddenly, it's like a, a, a round of congratulations. <laughs> I was like, when they reached out to me, I said, hang on a second, am I, get, am I in the wrong room? Didn't we just talk about this being a problem? All I'm hearing is people congratulating each other for, and I'm not saying, yeah, that's great that we have all these things, but one of the things you need to understand is that if we need to be, we have what we call the um, uh, the uh, success problem, where when we're successful, we're blinded to seeing the problems. We just see like, look at the successes. You need to become someone who, just like an entrepreneur, sees where the problem because it's it's the holes that sink the ship. It's not the body that is that is you know main one main thing. It's that hole that is sinking our ship. So it's these things that you need to pay attention to, and that doesn't mean just focus on problems just pointing at them, it's just to resolve them. And there, is, there wasn't something like that. So I think it's, it's it may be, a lot of people tell me this is Canadian being nice, I've only been here five years, so I did get my citizenship, so I'm technically Canadian. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm struggling with this because I think when something's wrong, it's, there's no harm in pointing at it. And I grew up by, especially being around my wife, my wife is a very tough entrepreneur by pointing, she never acknowledged, like it's, it's a day of celebration when once in a blue moon she acknowledges something good that I did. You know, every time it's like, but you missed this, but you didn't do that. And I learned to appreciate that because you know what that does? It makes me 10 times better. And I think that's what we need. We need to point out to what's not working. And there are voices, but those voices are always keeping calm because they don't want to upset people or not being listened to when they are. So they end up moving, going all their way, and that's what happens a lot of entrepreneurs sell out their companies. It's like, okay, I took care of myself, and that's it. And they help the community around them because that's all they can do. And there is not one thing that where communities come together. Um, and it's hard, like, look at Launch Academy. Launch Academy is the heart where 600 companies were introduced uh, to the Vancouver ecosystem. How much of the government money was poured there? A couple, maybe a couple hundred thousand? How much of the money was poured into Waves? $20 million. And Waves ended up being a failure. Not because the people there didn't do the hard work, they did amazing work. But the premise was wrong. Supporting bigger companies doesn't work. They don't need our help. That's at least my opinion. I'm not saying it's still an opinion, but I would, I would argue that a lot of the experiments around the world especially the miracle of Israel, for example, if you look at it from a tech perspective where amazing tech companies come out, um, is the guy was here, was at the Accelerator Summit that I attended three years ago. I wasn't invited back, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, he said, support small companies. That's the secret. And right after him, they started talking about supporting big companies. Like, it's like the person never spoke. So, we need a little bit of British uh, directness, probably. Mm -hmm. Here. So, yes. So, having said that. Really, on, on, on taking questions. Yeah, I'm just giving you a So, having said that, then, um, us being a company where we're starting to look at funding and look at seed funding and angels, um, what would you recommend? that we do then if we're based in Vancouver and as you mentioned, you know, access to funding has been you know, hasn't been the easiest, IRAP isn't the easiest to deal with or, or whatever else. Uh, what what would be your recommendation then? So the access to capital is always difficult. It doesn't mean that when you go somewhere it's easy. Sure. Um, you need so here these are three things that you need to do. Number one, the moment you start thinking the moment you name yourself an entrepreneur or thinking of an idea, start talking to uh, investors. Most entrepreneurs wait too long to talk to investors. They start raising money. 
uh, when they need it or just before. Raise money when you first start thinking about the idea. Start, start the raising. And that doesn't mean go pitch to, of course you pitch to entrepreneurs, to investors and say I'm gonna build it in two years or six months from now. So it's gonna give you, but start building those relationships. Start talking to them, start, here's what I'm thinking, what, what feedback do you have? Have the conversation, it's not a pitch for the conversation. Uh, so start very, very early. Uh, the second thing is money is money wherever it's coming from. So uh, don't limit yourself to Vancouver. And number three, focus, let your search be focused. So don't talk to every investor. Some investors and some investor firms are a complete waste of your time and money. So see what kind of companies they invested in. And if they invested in companies similar to yours, not necessarily in the same sector, but similar as in the kind of entrepreneur you are, the kind of company it is, uh, and talk to the people they invested in. So do your due diligence from that side. Um, and these are three things that you absolutely have to do. Maybe the fourth is grow your personal brand to the point that you know enough people that you don't have to like them. So uh, if, you, if you have 500 people on your LinkedIn, you're probably gonna have a tough time raising capital. Increase your, your the, 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 the breadth of your network in the area where you grow. So you need to know a lot of, if you're in tech right now, Reach out to a lot of investors. Why wait? It's kind of like an employee waiting until you lose a job to look for another job. You should have, you should make yourself hireable. I, in, in my whole career, or really, I was interviewed twice. Most of the time, I, because I hate being interviewed and I hate asking people for things, I make it so so that people offer me stuff. So make it, make it so, that's my recommendation. Become, increase the impact. Yes. So my question is kind of um, on the other end of this question. I was wondering, uh, you said, like previously, uh, entrepreneurs get really worn out after a few years fundraising. So on the venture capital side, venture capital side, what can investors or VCs do better, and what do you think, in your opinion, uh, should be changed in in that industry? Yeah. So I think from VC and investor side. Um, they, they're too rigid and conservative here in Vancouver in the sense that, and, and that's their prerogative, like they, they, they want what they want, obviously, like they're, they're, they want to invest in a company. Uh, but I think, I would recommend that they, that, they, that they take a bit more risk uh, in the sense that not with all their portfolio, but a bit of their portfolio support, start Garnering, like a lot of them to talk about deal flow. Most investors that I meet complain about they don't have enough deal flow. Well, where the heck deal flow is going to come from? It's going to come from entrepreneurs. So if you're not, if there's no one supporting those entrepreneurs to reach the level where you, let's say you invest in a company that has X, let's say revenue, all of those companies are going to come in. If there's no support for companies before, you don't have a funnel. So if I was there, I would say, okay, if I need to increase the deal flow, um, let's say I have a $5 million fund or $10 million to spend. Well, let's say 5% of that is marketing. Well, instead of spending it on marketing, let's spend it on like giving, this 5% is what? 500,000 or 200,000. Let's say 500,000 for the easier bit. So let's say 500,000, let's give 50 companies 10,000. And I'll have shares with them. Five of the, those 50 companies by just the law of odds, one out of 10 will succeed massively. I have 10 companies that are eventually going to make me probably all of my portfolio. It's as simple as that. Obviously, it's not. I mean, I'm making it simplified, but I mean, I would, I would do that if I was young. And that's one of the things that we're doing today. We just announced that we are opening uh, Adaptive Clouds, which is a venture capital company that's going to invest in early stage. So we're just in the, in, the, in the phase of creating our first spot. So the, this is what this is what I would recommend. And there are many different ways. There are all these kind of uh, great ways. I mean, you know, YC, uh, Y Combinator, basically discovered they they launched a fund because they discovered they're very good at finding companies very early stage, and they want to benefit from funding them again when they grow. So. Some of the biggest companies in the world came from these small, little, crazy ideas that nobody was willing to find. Yes? Um, <clears throat> you touched on money and money, um, and then go 
within my personal experience, we tried creating money overseas and the difficulty there with the culture of a physical building. I, I buy a building, I see my physical building, if I need to sell it, I can sell it, where software can fail, or something. And uh, you talked a bit about Vancouver being very conservative, Silicon Valley is very unconservative. Um, do you have any thoughts or advice around the different cultures around the world and trying to create money outside of Vancouver no. and some of the difficulties that we might face there? Uh, probably the easiest one is go to the US. The US is, is a massive market. I wouldn't, if you want to go to other cultures, probably you have somebody that help you or you have, for example, some origins there because navigating those cultures is hard. Um, the reason why I would go there is because there's a lot of investors that are, that, are, that are wanting a piece of the North American market. And they consider Vancouver an easy market to start with because they can't go through the valley. Like they would be lost in the valley, right? Nobody, nobody would look at them. Because there you have all these, these options. So there, in like a very small fish in a, in a very big pond, they come here. So they are interested to come into the market. Obviously, they have, a, they have different approaches and they might not have any, any idea of how the culture here works. So you would need, let's say, if you're getting Chinese investors, you would need somebody who's from China to help you navigate and help you, help tell you, you know, well, these guys are bullshit or these guys are actually are solid guys. I know I asked around something. So you need somebody to come. Like I would, I would, for example, deal with people from Dubai because I lived there for 11 years. I can navigate, I can tell, I, can, I, have, I know a lot of people I can ask around. So maybe, yeah, that's the connection for me. Uh, but the easiest one for us in Canada is North America. North America is not just the Valley, it's New York, it's Seattle, it's all these other, Denver, all these other, Texas, there's all these other uh, great states and cities that have many different people who cannot play in the Valley and want to diversify. And one of the ways to do that is coming to Vancouver. Vancouver is hard for them. So if you help them that, they can reach out and say, hey, um, if I you mentioned uh, Vancouver. Um, I get the, the global partnership guy from uh, Startup Pride came over from uh, King Tom. And uh, he was like, Vancouver really needs to build a tiny ecosystem. And I took him around to watch academies for everyone around here. He goes, I didn't know this existed. I said, you're in the tech space. Right? You know, you really, what, how can we help? You really, how can we help? Um, you know, we have this program, we have that program. You want to come here, let us know, you know, just like take, you know, help us uh, get them to do that next step. Right? Um, for example, these guys went and exhibited at a uh, global right? and the global is like 8,000 people. Right? And uh, also the people that are really, like, it's, it's hard to describe that atmosphere. Um, whether, you know, you can see all the talks on, uh, on YouTube, for example, uh, but being there, it's very, it's very, very different because of that atmosphere. People, the, the, the energy is, is very difficult to describe. And, uh, and that could be, you might get among startups, but again, like the capital we mentioned is, is a bit of a hindrance, but a lot of times people don't talk about that because it's like, just work on your startup. You'll get the traction, you'll get the money. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've heard over and over and over. Um, and that's one area that we're looking at, at helping. Um, Mentioned China, like I've been trying for 15 years to that, that same market entry thing into, into China. And um, aside from institutional people, people that are coming out that are already here in enrichment, sitting on the money, right? A lot of that money can move from real estate into these startups. And so there are those kind of opportunities. Um, other question I guess I kind of had was um, the fund that you're putting together, what, what, what verticals are you working on? We're on focused on emerging tech right now. And then, but mainly what we want to we do is we want to take those amazing entrepreneurs that we come across and they're struggling to find uh, support to support them. And the way we're doing it is that we're saying to we, we're getting partners that are software builders, marketers, and let's say security and educated content builders. And we say, we'll give, you, we'll give you money, but the way we're going to do is a large portion of that money, 80% is going to go immediately to those providers that we know can be great software whatever after we work with you. So you don't have to struggle to find tech talent, you don't have to struggle to find the right marketer, you don't have to struggle to, and that's how we're, we're doing it. And, uh, it's like these are trusted people that are not just an agency, these are actually people that are that built 
all the time for like solutions that are workable and stuff like that. So we're very excited. We're happy about doing that. And uh, obviously, the, the next center is a partner as well. And I'm, I'm taking the leadership role there. So it's, uh, it's fun. We see how well it goes. It's, it's one of these ideas that are big, big idea that uh, I want to help Vancouver. I really need. One of the things I advise you guys, like a lot of people when they publish about tech here, they publish hashtag BC Tech. Screw that, okay? Just publish and hashtags Vancouver everything that you do. Whatever there is, any news about Vancouver, any news, just put hashtag Vancouver. Number one, you will actually show up much better in the results in the sense that you will be seen by people who are interested in things about Vancouver and people will start knowing it. People in Vancouver don't know there's a tech scene in Vancouver. Tech is the largest employer in all of BC. They don't know. Some people like, tech? Where, where is tech? It's everywhere. Any other questions? Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you. Yeah.